Now you got to understand what are the publication ethics and what actually is the definition of publication ethics and what are the rest of things that we need to know regarding publication ethics. We so let us first of all try to understand what are the publication ethics. See, publication ethics are defined as a standard. Standard is a kind of standard measurement. We set certain standards for certain things. That is what we call publication ethics. Publication ethics is a standard of conduct. Conduct, how to behave, what to do, what not to do. That is called conduct. Publication ethics is a standard of conduct that guides the researcher, that gives a particular kind of guidelines to the researcher to act responsibly and follow a set of guidelines, a set of guidelines for conducting and publishing their research, for conducting and publishing their research. This is the general definition of publication ethics, that is what I feel. Publication ethics is a standard of code of conduct that guides the researcher to act responsibility and follow a set of guidelines for conducting and publishing their research. This is what we call publication ethics. The prime aim of research publication is to add to the existing knowledge for the betterment of society. This is what every researcher should keep in the mind, that any research is undertaken primarily for the betterment of society. And how is this betterment sought? This betterment is sought by adding to the existing body of knowledge. There is some existing knowledge and you are going to add certain things to the existing knowledge, which in turn is going to help the society or the improvement of the society. This is the key point that you should keep in your mind. If this is there in your mind, you will understand all the rest of the things regarding the publication and the research and everything related to it. What is an unethical conduct that we need to understand? Because I told you the primary important thing in, in relation to research and publication is to add to the existing body of knowledge for the betterment of society. That should be there in our mind. If instead of doing that, we give prime importance to the secondary purpose. Now, what is the secondary purpose? Secondary purpose, maybe I want a degree. That is also the secondary purpose. I want a placement. That is also a secondary purpose. I want to get to some position. That is also a secondary purpose. I have some pressure publication pressure from people around. That is also a secondary purpose. So these are some of the secondary purposes. purposes. Okay, so when this happens, that we tend to give importance to the secondary purpose, then the question of ethics arises. In prime importance to secondary purpose is the beginning of unethical practices in research and publication. When? See, primary importance should be given to the uh, addition, the purpose of adding something to the existing body of knowledge. If this purpose, this is the primary purpose, why are you carrying out research? Because I want to find out something that is going to be useful for the society. If I'm not doing that, then the question of ethics arises. This is the beginning of unethical code of conduct. This is the, this is, this has to be kept in the mind. Whenever you feel like going away from the things, you have to remember the prime aim of research is to add to the existing body of knowledge and that has to be done extremely honestly. That is, therein comes the question of ethics. According to Hussein and Chaudhary, publication ethics is a standard of conduct. What is it? Publication ethics is a standard of conduct that enables the researcher to act responsibly and follow a set of guidelines for conducting and publishing their research, which is beneficial to society. Try to understand. I'll read it out again. Publication ethics is a standard of conduct that enables the researcher to act responsibly, that enables the researcher to act responsibly and 
follow a set of guidelines for conducting and publishing their research which is beneficial to the society. This is the definition of publication ethics made by Saudi and Hussein. That is another definition of ethics because you know what is publication and what is research. We just have to understand what is ethics. So that is a definition of ethics made by Sir. That is a definition of ethics made by Frank Kena in 1973, which I'm going to read out again. Ethics is an academic discipline concerned with answering age-old questions about duty, honor, integrity, virtue, justice, and good life. Try to understand. The definition of ethics made by Frankena in 1973 is, it is an academic discipline. Ethics is an academic discipline. It is concerned with answering the age-old questions about duty. What is my duty? What should I do? What should I not do? Honor, integrity, virtue, justice, and good life. These are some of the questions with which this academic discipline is concerned. Okay. To put in simple words or to uh, present it in simple language, publication ethics can be called a set of guidelines. Try to understand. It's, it's a simplified definition. Publication ethics is a set of guidelines that acquaint a researcher with do's and don'ts in research and publication. Publication ethics is a set of guidelines that acquaints a researcher with do's and don'ts in research and publication. What should a researcher do in research as well as in publication? And what shouldn't a researcher do in research and publication? This set of guidelines is called publication ethics. Ethics are really important in publication and research. Why are they important in publication of research? So if the code of conduct given to the uh, students is not ethical, then this research wouldn't give the desirable results. The results that the researcher publish may not be useful for the society. Therefore, the uh, importance of publication ethics is there in research. What does it do? It truly adds the new aspects to the existing knowledge. Publication ethics, what do they do? If you follow the publication ethics and carry out the research and publish your research work, then what happens? It truly adds to the existing knowledge. And that is the real purpose of our research or any research. Okay. Then what happens if you are ethical in conduct, if the conduct of the researchers and the institutions and the universities is ethical, then it, it promotes the genuine cooperation between the bodies, our bodies that give the grant, or companies, and the researcher, or the university, and the researcher, or the university grant commission, and the researcher, and all other concerned bodies, and the researcher. What does it again do? It establishes the credibility of the researcher. It establishes the credibility of the researcher. If you are ethical, you are credible. One can trust you. Your research is trustworthy. Therefore, publication ethics are important because they establish the credibility of the researcher. They give real research benefits to the society as well as to the researcher. How do they give real benefit to the society? They give real benefit to the society because they are truly done research works and findings of a particular work. So they are genuine. And if a researcher does research genuinely, then researcher will really be benefited by it now as well as in the future because anything that is found by a researcher by working hard on it and honestly will always remain in the mind of the researcher and researcher can carry out, again carry forward his work of research. Then it makes easy for the researcher to take one research in the same area if he has done his research or she has done her research honestly and ethically, then uh, you can get funding easily if you are an honest researcher, if, you are, uh, if your research findings are really honest, genuine, and ethical. And the last one is researcher gets real satisfaction 
and the society get real benefit genuine satisfaction and the genuine benefit there is a body we have been speaking about this body c o p e w a m e i c m j e u g c these are some of the bodies uh, for which you have to understand the full form c o p e is the body uh, that is committee on publication ethics c o p e is the body whose full form is committee on publication ethics c for committee o for on uh, public people publication and e for ethics so c o p e you can call it cop cop is the committee on publication ethics then there is another body called w a m e that is world association of medical editors world association of medical editors this is the association of the world for medical editors it, it is uh, particularly meant for the uh, publication in medical science then there is icmje that is international committee of medical journal editors that is also specifically meant for research uh, carried out in medical field then there is a body called ugc you all must know it or you all must know it because ugc is university grant commission this is the sovereign body in india that looks after the affairs of higher education and research okay now uh, we have to talk about committee on publication ethics okay committee on publication ethics has developed a comprehensive guidelines for retraction and corrections in research paper what has it done it has developed a comprehensive set of guidelines it has developed a comprehensive set of guidelines for what a set of guidelines for retraction retraction your paper is being retracted i mean we write up a paper a research paper then we send it to the publisher publisher has the choice whether to publish it or whether to retract it give it back to you say giving some certain reasons probably saying that this paper lacks the clarity this is vague or this is you may say that the data is fabricated falsified or plagiarized but the publisher can give any reasons and retract your paper so cope has developed a comprehensive guidelines for retraction and corrections in research paper or article which serves as a guideline for the journals and publishing agencies this serves as a guideline for journals and publishing agencies according to resnick and dilse in 2012 they say unfortunately journals do not give a real reasons of retraction journals should give the real reasons of retraction it is expected that journals should give the real reason of retraction but according to them it was found that journals do not give real reason of retraction they write data unreliable instead of data fabricated or falsified what do they write data unreliable unreliable which is not trustworthy uh, we were talking about this that cope has developed comprehensive guidelines for retraction and corrections in research paper or article which serves as a guideline for the journals and publishing agencies unfortunately it was found that journals do not give real reason for the retraction they write data unreliable instead of writing data fabricated or falsified sometimes they simply write retracted committee on publication ethics we have to know certain things about committee on publication ethics what does it do committee on publication ethics advises publishers and editors it is a committee that advises publishers and editors on all aspects of publication ethics including dealing with publication misconduct if there is some sort of publication misconduct how publishers should deal with it that is also seen in it okay there are some core principles of committee on publication ethics that is c o p e remember c o p e co is committee on publication ethics and it has its core principles the core principles of uh, committee on publication ethics are providing pra practical resources to educate and support providing practical resources to educate and support members providing leadership in thinking on publication ethics offering neutral professional voice in current database these are the three core principles of committee on publication ethics i'll read them out again 
providing practical resources to education support members, providing leadership in thinking on publication ethics, and last one is offering neutral professional voice in current data. We have to understand why is there an unethical conduct? Why do people do or commit an unethical conduct? Why do people behave unethically? That also we need to understand. Some of the reasons are, I have listed some of the reasons which I'll share, them, uh, share with you. The first is peer pressure. Peer pressure, mental illness. Some of us, or I don't know, maybe none of us or many of us uh, are mentally ill. Mental illness, then there is stress, stress of work and other psychological factors. Certain psychological factors which make us believe that we should uh, we should behave unethically. Okay, and that is called mental mental illness. There can be a reason called stress or another other some other psychological reason. Okay, then financial and political influences. Uh, in the in this case, it is possible. For instance, you're getting some money for doing something. That is financial influence. Political influence, someone is asking you to do this, that is called political influence. That may be the reason, reason for unethical conduct. Then inadequate training, if you are not trained properly to carry out the research, if you are not properly guided by your guide or if you are not su properly supervised, then you will just uh, behave unethically in research. That is also one of the reasons. Then uh, one should be aware of the protocol of research. And if you're not aware of the protocol of the research, then also you will be led into an unethical conduct. So lack of awareness of protocol is also one of the reasons. Then poor communication between the researcher and the research teams or the research supervisor or research governing bodies. This is also one of the reasons. Then there are certain, uh, on certain occasions, there are some difficulties in uh, collecting the data that can also be one of the reasons for unethical conduct of the researcher and there may be some financial issues right? conflict of interest is another uh, uh, it is another term that can be used for uh, or that can be a reason for unethical code of conduct in research i have uh, the definition of conflict uh, conflict of research there are three definitions which i'm going to read out for you what is conflict of interest the conflict of interest occurs when public duty or professional responsibility cannot be delivered in an impartial manner due to personal interest. I told you the prime intention of undertaking any research is to add to the existing body of knowledge and being useful for the society or to be useful for the society. This is the prime intention of taking out the research, undertaking the research. If this has been replaced by the secondary purpose or secondary intention, the question of ethics arises there only. And then this is the conflict of interest. Interest is primary interest and secondary interest because the research is done in public welfare generally. The conflict of interest occurs when public duty, we have some duty towards the public, towards the society, and we as a professional, professional in the sense as a researcher, we have some responsibility. So this responsibility cannot be delivered in an impartial manner. We shouldn't be partial. And why do we do, the, do that? Due to personal, uh, personal reasons. This is stated by American Sociological Association in 2009. I'll read, uh, read it out once again to you. The conflict of interest occurs when public duty or professional responsibility cannot be delivered in an impartial manner due to personal interest. American Sociological Association says so. Okay, then there is another uh, definition done by American Association for Medical Colleges in 1990, which again I'm going to read out for you. The conflict of interest is a situation than a behavior. What is it? The conflict of interest is a situation than a behavior and it manifests as monetary or personal interest that adversely affect or seem to affect the researcher's findings. The conflict of interest is a situation, it is not a behavior or it is more a situation than a behavior and how does it manifest? It manifests as monetary or personal interest that adversely affect or seem to 
affect the researcher's finding this is what we have to understand there is another third definition made by icmje in 2017 a conflict of interest and bias exists when professional judgment concerning a primary interest is influenced by the secondary interest it is one and the same when the primary interest is influenced by the secondary interest there are certain types of conflict of interest that we're not talking about there is direct conflict of interest and indirect conflict of interest how are directly i mean how does it directly affect for example equity stock ownership patent and grant if researcher is given given certain things his findings can be affected he won't be impartial in his research indirect consultancy paid testimonies honoraria etc it is stated by elsevier in 2012 how does conflict of interest occur directly and indirectly the reasons for the conflict of interest are the equity stock ownership and patent patents and grants directly and indirectly consultancies paid testimonies and honoraria these are indirect conflicts of interest okay then there are two other types of conflict of interest called financial and non financial financial in the sense ownership managerial role or if the owner of a company is my relative okay and he offers me certain things or even if he doesn't offer me as he is my relative uh, i just try to change uh, falsify fabricate the data for the benefit of the company that is also the conflict of interest okay so what are the reasons financial reasons ownership or managerial role profit sharing understanding so let's say for instance there is profit sharing understanding between the researcher and the company or the firm or the research institute then this is possible because this is uh, related to finances holding equity stock options payments of royalties from ipr and consultancy fee etc are included in the financial uh, conflict of interest what are the non financial causes of conflict of interest non financial can be social recognition i would be probably recognized socially then publication because i need to have my publication i want to renew my grant or i need it for the career advancement now let's hurriedly go to publication misconduct what is publication misconduct fabrication falsification plagiarism that we know ffp duplicate submission inappropriate authorship if someone is not an author you are adding as a author you if you are buying the material and trying to pose yourself as the author of that material that is in appropriate authorship and there is one more thing called self plagiarism that we have to understand self plagiarism is defined by ugc in 2020 as reproduction in part or whole of one's own previously published work without adequate citation and proper acknowledgement and claiming the most recent work as new and original for any academic advantage account to text recycling known as self plagiarism this is stated by ugc that is what ugc has to say regarding self plagiarism you, you, on every book there is some uh, at the corner of the book copyright is written copyright act is there and they write that no matter is either fabricated falsified or plagiarized from some other source and if it is done it has been duly acknowledged if uh, someone finds this thing in the book let the publisher know about it for the corrective action this is generally written in the books okay so that is because of copyright act we have copyright act here copyright offers a legal basis for the issue, for the use and ownership of range of works why is copyright there copyright offers a legal basis for the use and ownership ownership of a range of works a variety of works copyright offers a legal basis for the use and ownership of a range of works what does it include it includes literature it includes imaginative works it includes theatrical work it includes musical work film broadcast and published edition because of the copyright act we are permitted or authors are permitted an exclusive right to copy distribute works in print or online medium and communicate to the public adapt or amend their works no no other person is allowed to do that except 
the author. Authors can also hand over the copyrights to third party. Being the copyright owner, the author may pass all the rights to users or a third party. This is also possible. That means you cannot reproduce the work written by someone. It is seen that uh, we go to the Xerox center with a book and ask the Xerox, uh, the, the person in the Xerox center to uh, the, make copies of the book. That is actually illegal under the Copyright Act. You shouldn't do that. You cannot even print a page for the purpose of business, in fact, uh, for, uh, for uh, educational purposes. It is not that strictly prohibited, but for the purpose of business, you cannot. Uh, the first thing that I want to tell you is you cannot Xerox the books of someone else. You cannot reproduce them, or you cannot use them without the permission or without proper acknowledgement. That is the Copyright Act. Okay. Predatory publishers and journals. Predatory publishing is, uh, publishing is also known as rights-only publishing. Try to understand what is predatory, rights-only publishing. You just write an article, you send it to the paper, send it to the journal, and it has been published. That is called predatory. What is actually the process? You write a paper, you send, uh, you send it to the publisher, publisher sends it to the blind review, and after blind review, if the reviewer finds that this is a proper paper, then it is published. If, publisher find, if the reviewer finds that there are some problems in the paper, reviewer returns the paper to the writer, then writer makes uh, necessary changes, sends it to the publisher, publisher again sends it to the reviewer, once the reviewer says that this is okay, then the paper is published in a journal. This is actual process, but it is seen that this process is not followed by many of the journals, and these are called predatory journals or predatory publishers. So, predatory publishing is also known as right-only publishing. It is an exploitative publishing academic business. Predatory publishing is an exploitative academic business and it is characterized by, what is it characterized by, what are the characteristics? They charge publication fee, actually there shouldn't be a publication fee, but they charge a publication fee for you. There are no reviews at all. It is considered that there should be review because every on, on the page of every journal, it is written that it is a peer-reviewed journal. But is there a peer review really? So that is also predatory. No review at all. No checking of article for the quality. Uh, the quality of the article should be checked, but it is not done in the predatory journal. No checking for article for illegitimacy. Legitimacy and illegitimacy, you understand? This is legitimately written, this is copied, this is plagiarized, this is falsified, this is fabricated. Everything should be seen, but this has not been seen in these kinds of journals. Therefore, they are called predatory journals. No editorial services. Editorial service should be provided to the writers, but predatory journals provide no editorial services. And to be very frank, predatory journals is a business carried out to earn money relationship and fame. Some people do it for money, some people do it to build the relationships a society, and some people do it uh, to have the fame, to become famous that I am a publisher of so and so. We have thousands and thousands of journal journals these days, and it is very difficult to differentiate between the predatory and genuine journals. Though there are of course guidelines, uh, we know that what do people generally do? They try to find out the ways and try to become the publishers. So it is also good to be really careful about the predatory publishers. It is not supposed that we should fall prey to these predatory publishers.